Oh guys, look at this beautiful bread. If you want to know how to make this, just keep watching and you're going to know exactly what to do to make this beautiful bread. Howdy folks, welcome back to Texas Cooking Today. Now in this episode, we're gonna be making some beer bread. Now beer bread is delicious. If you've never had beer bread, you really need to try it. And if you have a thing about alcohol and you like, just don't want it around you at all, all you have to do is just get some non-alcoholic beer. They do make it, and it's all there is to it. So guys, I'll tell you what, this is a wonderful, delicious recipe that everybody should know how to make. And when I was formulating this recipe, I intentionally went in a direction that it is, well, it was meant to be as simplistic and non-complicated as absolutely possible. This is a very special bread. It's a high hydration bread, and it has really neat qualities. So I'll tell you what, guys, let's get in the kitchen. Let's get busy making us a beautiful batch of beer bread. Come on, let's go. <laughs> there it is, guys. We're ready to do our ingredients. Now, got a lot of wonderful stuff sitting out here, but before we zoom in and take a close look at what we have there, I just want to say one simple thing. Bread making is about patience. It's about relaxing, kicking back, letting the dough do its thing and knowing that it's not going to be an hour or two later but a half a day later or more you're going to bake up a beautiful loaf of bread so you can start making this like the night before uh, the next day and that's fine you can do that it takes a long time for it to rise and that's okay slow rise times equal very good breads when it's done right so guys come on over let's look at this wonderful stuff Let's get busy making this fantastic tasting bread. Come on. There you go, now you can see everything quite clearly. I have put two different kinds of flour out here because I want to make it clear. You can make this bread with all-purpose flour or high gluten flour. Do not use a cake flour, guys, that won't work. The gluten content in it is too low to make the structure of the bread properly. And of course here you see high gluten flour. What that means, that's bread flour. So if you're out purchasing in the store and you want to find the right thing that's a high gluten flour, pick up a package of bread flour and you've got a high gluten flour. Uh, and the difference there is it just provides more elasticity and stretch uh, and, and, and internal structure to the bread that has more character to it. I really like using this stuff. All purpose still has enough in it to make very, very good breads, but also can be used as well as making cakes. That's the reason they call it all purpose. We're gonna be using four cups of flour. We are gonna be using one teaspoon of salt. I have over here some cornmeal, an unspecified amount, that's maybe a third of a cup or more, um, but we're gonna be using this not in the uh, dough itself. We're going to be using this to keep the dough from sticking to our pan. Right here I have four and a half teaspoons of fast rising yeast. Sometimes this is marketed as a um, what they call bread machine yeast or commercial yeast. Fast rising yeast. That's all the same basic thing guys. So that's what we're looking for. Four and a half teaspoons of that. And if you're wondering well, how many packages? That would be two packages of fast rising yeast if you're using the little packets or two cakes. Back here, this is three tablespoons of granulated sugar. Granulated sugar is to feed the yeast. Now the problem that you run into when you're making a beer bread is while we normally, when you're making bread, you would just use half this much yeast. But I have something that is going to slow down the growth and prosperity of this yeast so much that I had to double the amount of yeast in order to get proper rising uh, and also give it enough to really eat to make the bread work properly. 
the situation is, is we're putting beer in this, guys, okay? And the alcohol in the beer slows the action of the yeast, which slows down how long it takes the bread to rise. And a lot of, a lot of different things are going on there. But that basically is what it boils down to. However, what this does is it provides such flavor and character to this. It's unbelievable. And remember, beer is made from a type of wheat. It's barley, all right? So <laughs> they're, they're, they're uh, side by side in the plant family. Oh. <laughs> so that's all there is to it. Over here we got some equipment and I'm going to show you how you can do this with some very, very, very basic equipment. We're actually going to bake it up in a skillet. We're going to rise it in a bowl and I'm going to show you, you don't have to buy a sifter to sift your flour. Okay. So guys, let's get right into this and make us some beer bread. Okay guys, before I get busy measuring that flour out, I'm going to open my beer. As far as what beer do you use? Now, this is a particular thing, guys. If you want to help this along a lot in its, in its rising properties, look for what's called a true draft. Anything that's a real draft beer is going to work great in this, all right? I'm using a brown beer, and this is a draft beer because it's one of my homemade beers. Homemade beers are draft because we keep the yeast alive in them to, um, to make the carbon dioxide that is in the beer itself. Uh, that is what determines what draft is. It doesn't mean it came out of a tap. Coming out of a tap is beer on tap, not necessarily draft. Draft beer means that the beer is still alive. In other words, the yeast in it is alive. So that's what you're looking for is the word draft. And uh, so that's what I have here. I've opened this up to just allow some of the carbon dioxide to start fizzing off. And I'm gonna set it aside while we measure out that. Believe me, I would love to have some of that. Guys, you don't have to have a sifter to sift flour. You see this? It's a strainer, okay? And that's, that's one of the things I wanted to show you on this. That this is such a really easy way to make bread. And if you've never made bread before, they're gonna, there's a lot of people that'll tell you, just gently work the flour into the cup, you know, and, and so forth and so on. They go into all of this anal retentive detail about it. And all you have to do is just get some flour in there, tap it once, and all that does is if there's an air bubble down in there, that just broke it loose and the flour fell into it. I scrape off the excess into my container, and boom, one cup of flour. It's just that simple, guys. Some people will tell you, oh, that'll cause the flour to become compacted. If you tap it repeatedly, yeah, it sure will, but one tap will knock any air bubbles out and that's all. There we go. Off, two, four. That's all there is to it. Now, if you're going to use a strainer as a sifter, there's a couple of ways of doing it, but something you gotta know right off the bat is if you're tapping it on one side or the other, then it's going to have a tendency to, for the flour to go towards the side you're tapping. And it's just, you know, part of the laws of physics, guys. That's just kind of the way things work. I'm going to use the handle on uh, my spatula here, my, my actually my, there we go. See how it worked its way up? I can also just do this. It's quite effective. I'll sit and shake it. Some people bump it with their hand, but remember, same thing, it's going to walk up towards that side, so tip it, and that allows it to stay down as you're working. Isn't that nice? So here we are sifting out this flour. We didn't go buy a sifter to do it. Now, I own a sifter, sure, but using that doesn't really teach you much, does it? This does. It gets you there really easy. If you're asking yourself, why did he go through the trouble of sifting that flour? What is the purpose? The idea there is to make it light, guys. To make sure there are no lumps in the flour. To make the flour light and easier to work with. It also helps improve the structure of what you make and bake when you're cooking uh, breads and cakes and things like that. Sifting can make a lot of difference in texture. Let's move right to our next step. And that would be getting our dry ingredients worked into our flour. Now, there's a lot of old ways of making bread. And I wanted to create a recipe that anybody could do. The whole idea here is to make bread easy. 
to make it delicious, to make it fun to make. So I want to take my sugar, sprinkle it right over the top of my flour. I want to take my yeast and do the same. Those two just go together. Now, using a whisk, and I want to get a real good shot, so I want to bring the shot up just a little closer so you can look in here. I want to use a whisk to work these ingredients in. Okay, guys, when you're working ingredients into flour like this, just use a whisk, and all you have to do is spin the whisk while you spin the bowl. So I'm, I'm turning both hands just like this. One, two, three, four. Isn't that nice? See how simple that works and how well it will work your ingredients right down into your flour. I can now put my salt in. I don't put the salt directly on the yeast, guys, because, uh, well, salt impedes the growth of yeast. The same way our alcohol is going to impede its growth, so does that salt. And that's why I don't use too much salt in this. Uh, normally, for a bread this size, I would probably use two teaspoons of salt. But because this has so much working against it and working against its rise, I decided to reduce that to one. Uh, normally, I don't put that much sugar in a bread, but again, we're fighting that rising condition. So simple enough, dry ingredients are in there. I have a spatula here, and also, I have some gloves. I want to glove up for this. Guys, if you don't have gloves, when it comes time to reach your hand into this, take some of the flour that you have and not necessarily this, it can be this, but just rub it all over your hands really good so that they're totally floured. When you do that, it helps keep your hands from sticking to the dough that you're mixing up. And that's the advantage there. But I want quick cleanup because I'm, hey, I'm busy filming a show here. I don't have time for all the extra. I just want to pull the gloves off and move on. <laughs> okay, so I use cooking gloves. It also makes it a little bit cleaner and neater and that kind of stuff. Okay, let's go ahead and just get our beer in there. And remember, my goal was to make something simple to make. This doesn't require a lot of kneading, doesn't require a machine. Okay, you're not going to be sitting here working your hands to death. Understand something, I got arthritis in my hands. I don't want to knead dough anymore, okay? That's, that's not my goal in life. Okay. I have made a lot of dough. I mean, um, so many, so many loaves of bread over the years. So many different kinds of bread. Uh, of course, I'm bringing them all to you right here in this show. This one isn't one of my old recipes. This was actually a newly developed recipe. I've been working on this for a couple of weeks, trying to find the right formula, the right mixture, the right timing, uh, right temperature, all of that. You know, there's. There's a lot that goes into formulating a recipe. Now, as this is starting to come into a loaf, or a dough rather, it looks pretty ragged. But guys, understand something. It looks ragged and dry now, but in a few minutes, this is going to be so sticky and wet, it'll almost be unmanageable. And that's all right. You know, it's not going to hurt a thing because that's the way the dough's supposed to be. This is called a high hydration dough. It's supposed to be really wet, really sticky, and something you don't work with a lot. It just works itself. Now, when you're working with a spatula, if you want, just fold that over and push down. Fold and push. Just keep doing that, okay? And you can use the tip of that spatula to work that in. Okay, just like that. So. This is where, when it gets like this, this is where I just go ahead and venture on down in there. These nitrile gloves, these nitrile cooking gloves, guys, are very, very good at not really sticking bad, the same way my silicone spatula didn't. It'll stick a little bit to these, but it's not extreme. Now if you said, hey, you said you weren't going to be kneading that a lot. Well, I'm not. I'm not kneading it. I'm mixing it. Right now, I'm still just in the throws. There we go. See, I'm mopping up the sides of the bowl here. Now, all I want to do is see this part that isn't fully mixed in. I want to get that mixed into the center, so I'm just going to turn it a little bit like this. So I take it and rotate it under, bending it around. There we go. Now I'm finished. Okay, guys, I can just throw this down in my bowl to rise, but I've got a different bowl for this. I've got a clear one that I'm going to put this down into. See what I mean by sticky? 
high hydration okay so and 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 if you're making this you're you're at this point and you're going oh my god i can't believe that and of course if you're using the bread flour it's even stickier that extra gluten okay guys we are down to the part that takes patience but we also want to take note of volume if you've noticed i've placed this in a glass bowl and there's a couple of reasons uh, reason number one, I place this in the glass bowl, is so you, the audience, can take a look in there and see what this stuff looks like from the point of being a fresh dough that just hit the bowl, we just finished making that, to the risen product, and we'll be able to see what it looks like kind of inside because we'll be able to look underneath here to know what's going on in this dough. And it's going to be really neat to look at. It'll be cool, guys. You'll love it. Uh, to make it a little easier to view, I want to use this. The important part here is place this in a warm location. All right, this needs to be in a warm place so that it can rise. If you don't have a glass bowl to turn over like this, you can use a piece of plastic wrap over it. Uh, I do that a lot. In fact, we're going to do that later in this video once it is transferred to the skillet. Now, the skillet is what we're actually cooking it in. We'll be using some butter and the uh, cornmeal in that. I have a metal pan here, and I'm putting mine on this. And that's because my stove has what's called a standing flame pilot. And I can just place this sheet right on top of the standing flame pilot. It heats the whole sheet, makes it nice and warm. The heat goes up under here, keeps the top of my dough warm, the bottom, everything. Top of a refrigerator works good, guys. Um, other places in the kitchen, you just kind of got to look around. You can find a warm place in the home to put this or just set it on the counter. It may take an extra 30 minutes or an hour on your rise time if it's in a cooler location. Your bread, I can't tell you how long it's going to take to rise, guys. I made some yesterday in my final attempt on, on perfecting this recipe. That took me about three hours on the first rise and four hours on the second rise, and then I baked it. So it was an eight hour bread, basically, eight and a half with the time to make it. So what I'm saying is don't be in a rush. We're going to take our time. This needs to triple in bulk. The same way French bread is made, we're gonna triple our beer bread dough before we knead it, all right? And when I say knead, I mean just kind of punch it down, roll it off into this, and we're finished. Now guys, as I was mentioning to you earlier, two reasons that we have our glass bowl here. The, the, I mentioned the first one is, you know, good transparency. I want my audience to see this. But at the same time, here's what you need to know about yeast. We've got a lot fighting our yeast. We've got the alcohol fighting it. We've got the salt fighting it. And we want this to rise, okay? So don't need anything else fighting against it. Well, yeast and metal don't like each other, okay? So metal bowls, stainless bowls, or anything like that, avoid trying to rise dough in those. Uh, rise dough in glass, rise it in ceramic, rise it in plastic. But avoid putting it in metal because it just doesn't react well with the metal. It, it in, it in, the metal impedes the growth of the yeast. So there's your other reason for doing glass. Now i got to get this in a warm location and give it lots of time. Okay guys, sorry about the glare on the glass, but we have our dough here ready to rise and it's in its location, so we're just going to let it do its thing and I'm going to come back hour by hour. We're going to look at it on an hourly basis and go through this step by step. And that way you can just kind of see it on film, what it really looks like as it progresses. Well guys, we're back to take a look at this beautiful dough. This has been one hour. And I told you we were just going to check this hour by hour. You can see, yes, there's been some rising, very distinct rising. We see some little air pockets opening up on the surface of it. When we look underneath, look at those pockets. Isn't that wicked cool? See, look down there. Just huge pockets of air. And guys, that's what's going on inside of this. All right. And we want a lot more of that going on inside of this. So we're just going to let it sit here give it lots of time to do what it wants. Now here's the thing. So far this hasn't yet doubled in bulk. It's, oh, one and a half times. Pretty soon it'll double. Then pretty soon it'll triple. It'll be close to the top of this. It'll be really full in here. And at that point, 
I'm going to stir it again lightly and kind of just gently fold it in as we did the first time and we'll throw it down onto the skillet that's been prepared. But that's, I'm guessing, probably a couple hours away on this. Okay, so we're gonna cover it. We'll set my timer. We're gonna give it another hour. We'll take another look at it. All right, guys, there we are. We are now two hours in. Let's pull this back. See there? Isn't that wild? Look at all that. So, I'm gonna cover it again. Give it one more hour in this bowl and it will be about tripled at that point. As you can see, this is, this is just slow. You, you start dough at a different part of day, way different part of day than you plan on cooking it. If you're gonna cook dough in the morning, you start it the night before. And if you're gonna cook it in the evening, you start it early in the morning. And that's just the way dough works, okay? Mix it, go away and be patient. Now, we're gonna start the timer for a third hour. Guys, we have to prepare the pan that we're gonna be cooking this bread in. And what I have here is just some butter. You don't have to use butter for this. You can use, um, you can use margarine. It's not very good for this. You can use lard. You can use vegetable shortening for this. Uh, just anything that will provide a fat layer on that pan. And the fat layer is for the sole purpose of helping to hold the uh, the corn in place. We have that cornmeal that we want to stay bound to our pan. Now if you'll notice I'm bringing this up on the sides and that's because our dough is going to rise up on the sides guys. It's going to hit that side and if you don't do this that dough will stick. Trust me I've tried this many times and I learned my lesson in our trial recipes. As I was developing this recipe, it was quite interesting. Once I get the butter all over it, and it's nice and coated, let's go ahead and get cornmeal down in this. I need enough to fully coat everything. All right, I don't have to leave an excess in there, but I want everything to be completely coated in cornmeal. That's what I'm doing, getting my sides now. Because believe it or not, it's the combination of that cornmeal, primarily the cornmeal, but the cornmeal and the butter that really provide for a good non-stick release on this. Okay, that's good, right there. I'm just gonna tap out the excess and I'm done. One cornmeal and ready to go, ready to rise that bread pan. Wasn't that easy? Okay guys, it has now been three hours of rising in this bowl. It's almost tripled in bulk. Look at all the air pockets underneath there. Isn't that beautiful? I'm just going to simply take this, pull it free from the sides. It wants to stick, in it? There we go. And all I want to do is turn it upside down, and like I did earlier, kind of rotating it under. You see how sticky it is as I turn it under? <laughs> Okay, now, and that's all it takes, we're done. Now, if, if you're doing this with bare hands and not gloves, you wanna flour your hands real well. These, not a lot stick to it, but if you're doing it barehanded, a whole bunch will stick to your hands. There we go, it's in this. All I have to do, we're gonna let this rise again, guys. And this thing, believe it or not, is gonna go almost all the way to the top, all the way around, and is going to be domed up about an inch above the sides of the pan. Okay, so it's going to end up being a lot of bread once it's fully, uh, once it's fully risen. So that's actually tripling it in its uh, original bulk is what we're doing. Now it's just a matter of giving it more time. I'm going to put it back on top of that burner. I'm going to put some plastic wrap over the top of it. There it is, guys. Our plastic wrap, as I like to call it, sticks only to itself wrap. Just pretty much the truth of it. Okay, and it doesn't have to be on there tight. Just gently cover it. All it does is just to keep this dough from prematurely drying out. Now where the handle is, air likes to get in through there, so kind of wrap it around a little bit. And of course, it'll stick to itself under there. It sticks only to itself, wrap. Now I'm gonna put it back over that, uh, that burner, put it back in my warm location, and let it rise. 
we start the next one hour rise, guys. Okay, folks, it has now been just a little over two hours on this. My rise on this dough, let me pull this back, you'll see it's almost to the sides of the pan now. On one side it has reached the side of the pan. So all I have to do is just let it keep rising. I'm going to let it fill this sucker a whole lot more. It's going to almost double from where it is now. Remember, this is a, uh, a long rise on the second rise. So we just give it plenty of time. It's going to sit here on my stove and keep, keep doing what it does. All right, so there's just no rush on it. I just wanted you to see it step by step. All right, here's your view after three hours of rising. It is now hitting the sides of the pan and it's just now starting to rise up on those sides of the pan. Back on the far side, just hitting it. This side, it's about halfway up. So it's doing the right thing. We just got to give it more time. We'll give it another hour. We're three hours in now, one more to come. Well, guys, take a look now. This has been a little over four hours. There are some pockets that have opened up on top of the bread. It's getting a lot more character up in there. And that's just kind of part of it. That's what we're looking for. It's about halfway up the side of the pan, all the way around on the edges, or slightly more. And that is absolutely what we're wanting. Now, I would like this to rise just a little bit more. I want it to be about three quarters of the way up the sides or better. The center on this is already over an inch over the side here. Uh, you know, when you look at it at a low level, you can see how it's very domed over the sides of the pan. So the thing of it is, is this is coming along fine. However, it's time to start prepping the oven. Now I'm going to set my oven for 400 degrees. And the thing of it is, is I want my oven not to preheat for 20, uh, 15 or 20 minutes. I want it to preheat for a long time. I want my oven to have heat deep into the walls of the oven, not just the interior space, the right temperature, but the whole thing on the inside, the inner walls themselves need to be very, very hot. And the reason behind this, at the beginning of my cook, I'm going to open the oven and spray this down with water a couple of times. And I'm just going to use a simple spray bottle. It's not a very difficult thing to do, guys. It's just you open the oven, pull that out, spray it, and then put it back in. And what this does is it helps to develop a harder crust on the upper part of the bread because it requires that the upper crust bake longer in order to brown. That's kind of one of the ways that um, bakers use to, you know, make a, a bread a little bit crispier and crustier on the outside. So that's what we're doing right here. It just prolongs the amount of time it takes to get the crust at the right temperature and uh, the right color. Remember, the bread tells us when it's ready to be cooked, not the other way around. Okay guys, now our bread has been rising with this plastic on it this whole time. It's been about four and a half hours. And around the edge, the very edge there where it's contacting the pan, it looks a little darker brown. And that's because it's actually drying a little bit on the outer part of the dough right there, where this is still very wet on top. Now that's gonna cause uneven browning in the oven. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this off as easy and gently as I can. And just give the bread time to kind of stretch and work with it as it comes off, guys. Because if you pull too quick, you'll have bad consequences. It can cause it to fall. But we don't want that. We just kind of want to expose the top of it so that it will give us a nice even drying. All right, now I allow it to just keep rising. We're going to allow it to rise open like that. It will continue pushing up. It's looking really cool, guys, isn't it? They've got this beautiful texture on top. Okay, guys, this is finished. It's rising. It has dried just slightly on the outside. It's wonderful now. It's got such character on the outside of it. So what I wanna do is I have a little device here. This is called a Misto, and uh, it's just a simple pressure sprayer that you pump up. I have it filled with water, and I'm gonna give this a light spray. 
on top. Now you can do that with a trigger sprayer also, it works just fine. A gentle light sprinkling of salt. I like that. It's just something that adds character to the top of that bread that I like to do. Now, straight into the oven. 400 degrees. In 10 minutes, I'm going to open the door, gently pull that out, and spray it again on top. Put it back in, and I'll do that 10 minutes again after that. So, 10 minutes into the cook, spray it. 20 minutes into the cook, spray it and then let it finish baking. And it should take around 35 minutes for this to bake into a golden brown. Guys, let me tell you, the smell in here is intoxicating. It has been 10 minutes. I have my sprayer ready and an oven mitt ready. So I'm gonna open this up, spray it quickly, close it, and let it bake some more. Look at that. Gorgeous, isn't it? Now guys, what that spraying does, that just helps it to bake. Well, it helps that crust to take a little longer to brown. And when it does that, it develops a deeper crust, a thicker crust, and it has more character that way. So that's the reason I do that. Now, another 10 minutes, we'll spray it again. Okay guys, one last time, I'm gonna spray the top of it and that'll be that for that. Look at that top, how beautiful the brown is on it. Lovely. Oh wow, it is beautiful guys. That was a 30 minute bake. Look at that. Good, crusty, hard top surface there. It didn't stick at all. There was no problems with that. We have an absolutely beautiful loaf of bread here. I give it a few minutes. Well, actually more like about 15 minutes just to cool down and set really nice. And then I'll slice into it and we'll take a look and see exactly what that's like inside. There it is guys, our beer bread. Beautiful, delicious beer bread. First, before I cut into this, Give you a good look. Lovely color on it. Nice structure, beautiful bottom. Gorgeous bread, okay? Now this isn't, uh, well, we'll just cut it open. We'll let you take a look. Let you see for yourself. There we go. Right there, guys. Beautiful, even textured. Lovely beer bread. This is definitely something that you should want to share with your friends. A beautiful item to add to a meal. Mm. Mm. Wow, so good. Sweet. The flavor of the barley's there, not so much a beer flavor, just a beautiful barley flavor. Mm. The color is rich. The flavor is magnificent. Guys, this is the kind of bread you need to make for a party, for a celebration. When you want something really special in a little bit, well, I'm going to make a garlic spread to go on it and I want to toast it. It's going to be unbelievable. So please enjoy your beer bread. Thank you for watching. Mm. Thank you very much to my subscribers. Guys, if you would, please click the like button. It really, really helps me out and I do appreciate that so much when you do that. Also, if you haven't subscribed, why not? Hey, I'm coming out with new recipes constantly. It's on a regular basis now. You see me on Thursdays. There's some good recipes here. So guys, join the club, go ahead and subscribe, and thank you, thank you very much for watching Texas Cooking today. And please do one last thing, just, just have a good day. <laughs> bye bye guys.